All right. Welcome to Jesus, everybody. Glad that we're finally able to get going on this class. You should have downloaded the syllabus from the, the website. If you haven't done that, you need to because you've got assignment sheets uh, on there that you're going to need to be um, filling out. <clears throat> but also in that particular uh, syllabus, we talk about some of the objectives of this class uh, with exegesis, namely what we want to do and what we intend uh, to accomplish is developing a methodology of studying God's Word. That's basically what exegesis is. <clears throat> Most everybody thinks they know how to study the Bible, uh, but the fact of the matter is that's really not necessarily the case. Uh, People read the Bible, but they don't know necessarily how to study the Bible. And so in this class, we want to talk about <clears throat> how it is that we should uh, be studying the Bible. And I think you'll find it uh, very practical and very uh, very useful. Now, basically, the, the assignments in the class are going to be as follows. We'll have a notebook, which you can submit electronically if you want to, or you can uh, send it to me hard copy. That'll be worth 15% of the grade. Reading assignments <clears throat> will also be 15% of the grade. Um, you've got a sheet that you should have downloaded that <clears throat> breaks down the chapters in the book and kind of a Disclaimer, I guess, <clears throat> is that the, we've got a new textbook, uh, and the, the reading assignment is broken down with uh, the second edition, not the third edition, and so just make the adjustment accordingly on uh, which edition. Is there anybody that, that has the second edition? I have second and third. Second. <laughs> well, use the third, but use the second, Kathy, if that's what you've got. Don't uh, spend any money on the, on the new one if you already have number two. <clears throat> um, but as far as the, the reading, the chapters that are assigned uh, is what you need to pay attention to, not as much as the, uh, the page numbers that are now wrong because of the, <clears throat> the new edition. Now, the same also is true for the um, assignments that I'm going to have you do. And <clears throat> I'm going to redo those when uh, I have opportunity. I just got, on Friday, I just got the third edition myself, so I haven't had a chance to make some of these changes. But if you downloaded the syllabus, then you had um, these various assignment sheets that look like this, <clears throat> and uh, some of them, you know, will have a scripture that you're supposed to do something with, and we'll talk about that when, when we get to those various uh, assignment sheets. But that's that's what I'm talking about, reading from the book, and then the assignment sheets are going to be a part of uh, what we're learning from the textbook. Now, there'll be quizzes. <coughs> <clears throat> as well, that will be over the assigned chapter. And if you notice in the book, I've got it, or in the syllabus, I've got it broken down week by week on um, what your assignments are to be. For example, week one, <clears throat> you can see what my objectives are for, for this week in the class. But you have the following assignments. You have uh, to complete the first worksheet, which is it says page 7 on it. <clears throat> it's not page 7 in your syllabus, but it's page 7 out of the worksheet that will be due um, this coming Thursday on Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And I'll talk some more about that in just a minute. But that's going to be 15% uh, of the grade is those worksheets. 15% will be quizzes, and then we'll have two exams <coughs> One 
exam that uh, follows the, uh, the introduction, the Old Testament exegesis, and then the final exam will follow uh, New Testament exegesis and exegetical fallacies, which will be uh, the parts, really parts three and four uh, of the class. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about what you need to do for uh, that first assignment sheet. <coughs> The assignment, and again on the bottom right it says it's page 7, find a minimum of 30 observations in Acts 1, 8. <coughs> List them below. Avoid making interpretations or applications at this stage. That is, stay with observations. For example, an observation would be to note that the passage starts off with a conjunction, but this conjunction connects the sentence to the one above it <clears throat> in a contrasting way. However, if you were to note that the Holy Spirit empowers us for evangelism, that observation falls into the category of interpretation or application. Do not enter into interpretation or application phase yet. Limit all 30 of your observations <coughs> to the details and not to the interpretation of the details. <clears throat> Work hard, dig hard, read and reread the passage. Do not quit till you've found at least 30 observations. Try to find more than 30. I have 65 observations that I've gotten from Acts 1 8. So I believe that you can come up with 30. Surely, you come up with 30. Don't call me Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to use the back of the page. I've got numbers 1 through 13 on the front. Uh, I did not continue to number 14, 15, 16 on the back. I figured that you guys were more than capable of doing that part. So 30 uh, observations. If you give me 30, then you're going to get an A. If you give me 35 or more, then you'll get an A+. plus. So that's how that will work. Do you want these um, on this particular page, or can we type them up separately? Oh, you can do it separately. And can we submit them electronically, or do you just want to know that we got them done? Uh, or do we need to print them? I, what do you yeah, think? I think you could print them off. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right, do you understand what, what I'm looking for? Let me let me give you some other examples. Uh, turn your Bibles to Acts 1. <laughs> noticed as he gave the example that it starts out with but. Alright, so we talked about the, the word but is a conjunction, is a contrasting conjunction, and so we make that first observation. You. Alright, so uh, <clears throat> the subject of this sentence or those that are being discussed in this sentence are reflected by the word you. Now, uh, you could say that he's talking to the apostles, but don't say that because the verse doesn't say that. Uh, but you uh, is, there's a specific group of people. He didn't say all. He said you. Shall, all right? Shall is a verb. Uh, shall receive uh, is a verb. It's a future tense verb. So he's talking about something that they are going to receive that they don't now have. It's going to be something that's going to be in the future. And then you could talk about that it's going to be something that they're going to receive. All right? It's not going to be something that they're going to have to go look for. It's not, not going to be something that is going to require any effort on their, their part. They're going to receive it sometime in the future. <clears throat> what they're going to receive is power. All right? So he says, all right? At some point in the future, what you're going to receive is power. Okay? Don't want to say any more about that. Uh, you're not going to get into, well, he's talking about the miraculous tongues that they got on the day of Pit. No, that's not what Acts 1 8 says. Just what does Acts 1 8 say? It says, You, 
shall receive power. That's what the verse says. We're isolating the various parts. Anyway, you're wanting to find 30 of those. And it counts to say, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's one point. In Judea, that's another point. In Samaria, that's another point. In the remotest part of the earth, that's another point. So, break it down, isolate, look at the particulars, and I can just about guarantee you that when you get done doing that, you'll say, I never thought one verse could say so much. Because people look at that and they say, you got to be kidding. 30 observations out of one verse, that can't do it. But you can, and you can do a whole lot more than that. So, anyway, that's due Thursday, and uh, I'll collect that at the, at the beginning of the class. So, just to recap, once again, please, uh, <coughs> just pick any verse. Yeah. No, no, this particular verse. Oh, this one eight? Just, okay. one just eight. one eight, okay. Yeah, just that one verse. <coughs> All right, also, you need to, to begin the uh, reading of the textbook. By Thursday, <clears throat> you need to have the interpreter journey read and how to read sentences. You can see that those are not super long chapters, um, nine pages for one, and then it looks like about uh, 14, uh, 16 pages for the, the second one. But those are going to be the chapters from whence comes a quiz. So it may be that we'll start Thursday class off uh, with the quiz, and it will be on uh, those two chapters. So that's the way the class will break down and how the, uh, the grading will be done. Any questions on any of that? Yes, sir. So the quiz is, I mean, obviously anything's fair game, but for the most part they'll come from our reading? No, they will only come from the reading. Okay. <clears throat> will it be just the reading from the that we had to have done by the, that class period, or will it be like everything we've read up until that? Yeah. Uh, good question. No, it will only be the assigned test for that day. Um, this one. Okay. Anybody else? <clears throat> well, he has them. Um, All right. Well, let's begin then in some introductory things about exegesis. <clears throat> I want to start out by asking the question, what is it <clears throat> and why is it important? it is, I'll define <clears throat> more uh, specifically a little bit later on. But why it's important is because I believe this is the way to honor God the best that we know how. By studying His Word in a way that uh, recognizes the importance of every single aspect of of, of his work. We're doing a whole lot more when we do exegetical work than lip service. A lot of people uh, offer lip service to God's word, but <clears throat> they're not really diligent students of God's word. Exegesis is honoring God in the best possible way that I know how to, to honor him and his word. Now, when we talk about exegesis, here are some tools that you may want to uh, acquire for your library as uh, time goes on. <clears throat> now, what I found is that there are a lot of people that think they know what exegesis is, um, but... When I read their book on exegesis, it's pretty apparent that they really don't know what exegesis is. They're using the word. Uh, a guy told me that went to another school of preaching. He said, yeah, the, the teacher there was teaching this exegesis. 
He said it wasn't exegesis at all. We didn't learn how to study the Bible at all. He said it was a class kind of on hermeneutics, but it certainly wasn't a class on exegesis. So there's some confusion out there as to what really is exegesis. But here are some good tools. First, Gordon Fee's New Testament exegesis. Now you can see from the title that what Fee is trying to do is focus just on New Testament text. And he's trying to make it practical for just about anybody and everybody. He does say pastors, and so the idea of some elements to that, that it's going to appeal to clergy, is certainly part of the book. But basically, this really is somewhat of a handbook for just about anybody that wants to learn how to do some exegetical work. Then second, and this is my all-time favorite, is Walter Kaiser's Toward an Exegetical Theology. Just trying to cram all that. It's hard to believe that that book is over 20 years old. Actually, more like 30 years old. But this is a great book. And Walter Kaiser, as you can tell from the title, is Toward an Exegetical Theology. And now he's taken doing exegetical work, and then what does that exegetical work mean as far as what you believe, your theology, the way you view God, the way you view ministry, the way you view the church, uh, and so on. And so it's a, it's a very good book. But uh, as far as those in the denominational uh, realm, I would say that Walter Kaiser is the best, best exegete uh, out there. Uh, now, Gordon Fee is pretty good, uh, but Walter Kaiser, I think, top, top is Walter there. Kaiser the, uh, the guy that grew up Baptist, that taught in a bunch of schools? Is that yeah, he was a longtime professor at uh, Trinity Evangelical in Deerfield. Yeah. Okay. And then another uh, thing by him, Legitimate Hermeneutics, in a book edited by Norman Geisler. Yeah, what he's doing in that particular chapter is he's laying some exegetical groundwork before he gets into the hermeneutics, which is uh, pretty valuable. That whole book, by the way, is a good book um, on inerrancy. John Hayes and Carl Holliday, Biblical Exegesis of Beginner's Handbook.
going to play with this a little bit to um, move this up because I don't think you're going to be able to see the, the bottom of that if I don't. Testament exegesis, but Douglas Stewart book is uh, a good one. There are some other books out there, but those are the five that uh, that I would recommend if you're going to spend some money buying some books on exegesis. Um, there have been some uh, that have come out more recently, but I don't think that they're they're newer, but they don't they're not better uh, than these. And so you might be able to get these off of a uh, used bookshelf. Or are you familiar with abebooks.com? Um, if you're not, um, you can find just about anything on that website because what they are is they're a network of both uh, bookstores and uh, private individuals that have books that they want to sell. And so if you got on there and typed in you know, Douglas Stewart Old Testament Exegesis, it'll call up a list of everybody in the world, literally, that has that book that wants to sell it. And it'll tell you the condition of the book and it'll tell you how much uh, they want uh, for the book. And so you can get a used one, and if it's got ruffled edges or, or uh, you know, the, pay, the book's been damaged some, then, you know, the price will be reduced, and maybe you don't care about that. You just want, want to get the book. So anyway, ABE, American Book Exchange, is what that stands for, abebooks.com. Uh, and... Um, you can you can get these books probably get all of them and probably get them at uh, a greatly reduced price. Okay. Those of you that uh, were at the lectureship remember this particular quote from Margaret Anderson. <clears throat> oh preacher, holy man, hear my heart weeping. I long to stand and shout my protest. Where is your power? Where is your message? Where is the gospel of mercy and love? Your words are nothings, nothings. We who have come to listen are betrayed. <clears throat> Servant of God, I am bitter and desolate. What do I care for perfection of praise? Cursed be your humor, your poise, your diction. See how my soul turns to ashes within me. You who have vowed to declare your Redeemer, Give me the words that would save. Sometimes we spend so much effort becoming pulpiteers that we're no longer spokesmen for God. That we're polished, maybe we're funny, uh, but as far as really giving somebody something that is going to be valuable for their soul, for their lives, for their eternity, we're just not. And it's sad that we've gotten to this point, but we have. And we have classes on homiletics, and we need to, because we need to become better at communicating, but we need to become better at communicating the Bible, communicating God's Word. And that's where I hope that you can see how exegesis and homiletics merge together beautifully, because if you're doing exegetical preaching, then you are 
revealing and preaching God's word probably in a way that they've never heard before. They've never heard preaching like this. They've never heard Bible texts analyzed and discussed uh, like this before. And it'll be something that hopefully, if you do it right, will be encouraging and motivational, but more importantly, it'll be valuable to them uh, for their own spiritual lives, their own spiritual walk. But we've got the wail from the distressed souls out there, people that are so sick of the kind of watered-down, milquetoast preaching that they're hearing Sunday after Sunday. And again, using the phrase lip service uh, to the Bible, you throw in a couple of Bible verses, but you don't really spend any time studying God's Word. Now I've said, and those of you that were in Romans remember when in chapter 15, I pointed out that, that preaching is worship. But I'm afraid that some of our sermons are not worship. Now the reason that preaching is worship is because all of us are engaged in an intense examination and study of God's Word. And we're honoring God, we're praising God, we're demonstrating love to God when we are spending time in His Word together. And the preacher is walking us through that, but we all are doing it. We're all worshiping God through the study of His Word. So what happens then when the preacher doesn't draw us to any Bible text? When the preacher is telling us stories, jokes, prolonged illustrations, but we're not being drawn to any Bible verses. How is that worship? It's not. And so I'm afraid that Sunday after Sunday, we're engaging in the four acts of worship. When it's supposed to be five. And the preacher is to blame. And so when we presume to get into the pulpit, we need to be listening to the Margaret Andersons of the world that are the, 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 the wail from a distressed soul. Give me the words that will save. Give me that which is going to be valuable, something that is going to be applicable to my life, to my spiritual walk, to my relationship with God. And that's what exegesis will help us do. Stephen Smith, in a book that uh, he wrote, I don't, it's relatively new. I think it was maybe two years old. We're reading it for Dad's class. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought Bob required it. Well, here's a quote on page 134 that I thought uh, was very good. I am amazed at how many times I take the subtle temptation to offer without warning my opinion alongside the authority of Scripture. While done innocently, it does not reflect a complete surrender to Scripture, a surrender that parallels my surrender to God. Now, if you've done much preaching, can you not relate to what he's talking about? It is so easy to just slide into an I think, or I believe, and so we're looking at a Bible text, and we're honoring God by looking at a Bible text, and the very next thing we're doing is we're throwing in my viewpoint, the way I see this or that. He goes on to say, the surrender of my will to God's will is a daily, hourly struggle. So in preaching, every sermon is a chance to show my love for him by lifting his word above mine, his authority above mine. Remember, we are not inventors. We're proclaimers. When we think about exegesis, <clears throat> then we really understand the power of of what Smith is saying here. We understand our role and what it is, what's my job 
as I step into the pulpit or as I become the teacher of this Bible class, what is my role? What is it that God wants me, needs me, expects me to do? Well, when I understand I'm lifting His authority above mine, His word above my word, then I got it. And exegesis is that very thing. The only reason that you would do exegetical work in the first place is because you want to fully exalt Him and His Word. And you want to make sure that when you're preaching or when you're teaching, you've got it exactly right. And you are giving it exactly the way God has given it uh, in the first place. Okay, so, the word exegesis, as you might have gathered, is a Greek word. It's a compound word from ek, which means out, and a geistos, which means to guide or to lead. Each one of us comes, you know, to this point with different lenses, different things, different ways we see things, we understand, we digest, you know, plus our prior knowledge, what we've learned over the years, and as being a product of our upbringing. Uh, how can we know? I mean, each one sees things from a different view or according to his, what's shaped and formed him or her. Uh, Bible study, take out of the text what the text is intending to stay, say. How can we be on the same wavelength? Exegesis, when done correctly, is going to eliminate all those externals that you bring to the text. You know, your different background, the things that you were taught uh, growing up, maybe the views that you formulated uh, through your own study through the years. Exegesis will either eliminate or confirm the legitimacy of those things which is why exegesis is the only way to go. Because it cuts out the fat and keeps us with only with the, the truths of God's Word, what the text is intending to say. And that's, uh, that's all. <clears throat> all right, so what's involved in this? Okay, <clears throat> exegetical work requires the student to apply the fundamental principles of research. <clears throat> Translating, interpreting, word studies, historical considerations, genre of literature. And if you don't know uh, what we mean by genre, then don't worry about it. We'll talk about that um, later. <clears throat> but 
Our end goal is what did the inspired writer mean? What did Moses mean? Uh, what did Paul mean? And the only way that you're going to be able to get to where you can answer that question is to do this kind of research. And that does involve studying words. It does involve uh, considering context. It does involve uh, a number of questions that you ask. And so right off the bat, you should be getting one important point, and that is exegesis is not for the lazy. Um, the lazy person wants the fast food, McDonald's, get just tell me what it means uh, mentality, and they don't want to go through all of this extra stuff. I mean, didn't Denny already do that? Uh, so if I want to find out what a passage in First Timothy means, can I just look at Denny's commentary and that's good enough? No, that's not good enough. Not if you're going to truly be honoring God because you're not honoring God by looking at my commentary. You're honoring God by getting into His Word and studying uh, the various aspects of what that particular passage is saying. So point number two, exegetical study makes diligent effort to keep from doing eisegetical work. <clears throat> Eisegesis is based upon the Greek word preposition eis or ace, which means into. So now you're leading or guiding something into the Bible text. Now, most people are very good at eisegetical work, of putting something into the Bible. But exegesis keeps that from happening. All right, so how does that, first of all, when you're doing exegetical work, you have to focus on the text alone. As you will find with the Acts 1-8 exercise, you're forced to just focus on that text. And <clears throat> the temptation will be for you to run elsewhere, but that's not the assignment. The assignment is, give me 30 points from that verse, from that one solitary verse, find 30 observations. Well, that's the beginning stages of doing exegetical work, because... You can't go anywhere else. You've got to stay tied to that one verse. Also, it keeps you from doing eisegetical work by making the student draw or defend conclusions that can only be proven by the text.
Well, exegesis is. Yeah. But eisegesis is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm in. <clears throat> yeah, I, I started thinking about what you were saying. John 1.18 uh, has the word exegeomai. Uh, that's exegesis. How is it used in that context? That <clears throat> Jesus is going to make known the Father. He's going to reveal the Father. So, that's what Jesus is doing. He's bringing out uh, the truth about the Father. You said that was 118? John 118. Thanks. Then, <clears throat> another benefit of exegesis is it exposes any man-made, man-inserted additions. things that is the great aspects of exegetical work is you always got the question now where are you getting that? Where where does that come from? Well I mean it then they, they look at it and you see, well that's not really what it says, is it? <clears throat> so conclusions or assumptions are being made, but exegesis forces you just what is the passage saying? Nothing more, nothing less. Just what is it saying? And then it keeps you from uh, drawing these other conclusions that, you know, people say, well, I sort of assumed that this was what was meant. Well, but what was said? What does the passage actually say? <clears throat> All right, let's talk about what exegesis is not. First of all, it is not like a commentary. <clears throat> and well, we're just going to have an extended discussion on this verse. No, that's not exegesis. Uh, exegesis is more than a commentary. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, uh, most of you already know, but those of you that don't uh, will know that I am not a big fan of commentary. And the reason why is because commentators are not exegetes. They haven't really learned how to deal with the text. Commentaries are frequently in a hurry to rush to application. And so as a result, you kind of skip the most important part, and that is, what is this passage saying? And why is he saying that? How does it fit with what he's been talking about and what he's going to talk about, uh, which I refer to as context? What is the context of a particular verse? <clears throat> so, okay, baptism for the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. What on earth is that talking about? Well, I go to my favorite commentary and I pull it off and he says it means this. Okay. So then Sunday morning comes and I tell them, all right, you know, we're in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, and this is what that means. But we never exegeted the passage. We never looked at the baptism for the dead phrase in its greater context. Are there any words being used in that verse that maybe we're, 
we need to study, that we're not familiar with what those words mean. Um, what was he talking about before verse 29? What was he talking about after verse 29? <clears throat> so the, the lazy student wants to go to a commentary, pull that commentary off the shelf, and then that becomes his or her view on what a particular passage is saying. Well, uh, exegetical work isn't, it's not like a commentary. It doesn't work like a commentary. <clears throat> Second, well, commentaries frequently give a general meaning of a passage followed by application. Very few commentaries actually walk you through the process that got to interpretation. How did that commentator arrive at the conclusion that this passage means that? Well, they're not going to go through that. That's why they're not exegetical. And a lot of times, commentators couldn't do that even if they wanted to. They wouldn't be able to walk you through the process that led to the conclusion of what baptism for the dead means in 1 Corinthians 15. Because they don't know. All they know is what they've been taught, and they've got stuff from other commentaries that they've scored, and now they're putting that in their commentary. <coughs> Exegesis is a process where the student dives much deeper into the passage. We're doing a whole lot more work with the passage than a commentator uh, probably has ever done or will ever. <laughs> we're really digging deep. Uh, we're asking the right questions. We're looking at context. We're looking at meaning of words. We're uh, looking at the way those words have been used in other places in that book. Uh, lots of questions that exegesis. Uh, an exegete is going to do that a commentator is not. <clears throat> Briggs had the following quote, The exegete is like the mind. He must free himself as far as possible from all traditionalism and dogmatic prejudice, must leave the haunts of human opinion, and bury himself in the word of God. He must descend beneath the surface of the word into its depths. the analogy that the exegete is like a miner. Because you're not going to just do surface work. Because that's not where the treasures are going to be found. The miner finds that vein of gold when he's willing to just really start picking and digging and shoveling, digging some more, and then all of a sudden you come across something that's like I'm rich. Well, so is it with exegesis. Then you start working on something and you start digging and then you suddenly find something and it's like, man, I'm rich. 
you're rich spiritually because you went through the work to find out what something needs, and you know it was hard, and you know it took you some time, but it was well worth the effort because of the treasure that you have at the end. The fact of the matter is, God doesn't give us all of his treasures uh, with surface language. There are pearls that are buried beneath the surface. There are those veins of gold in God's wisdom that are uh, only for the person that's willing to roll up the shirt sleeves and, and get after it. But boy, how rewarding it is when you go through the process and you discover uh, these treasures and you never once look at a commentary. Yeah. You're talking about the work involved and this, that, and the other. I know it will be different. There's a lot of variables. New Testament versus Old, I'm guessing, and individual scripture, but typically on a scripture like what you've given us, Acts 1-8, how long will that take, typically? To do, if you, if you're, for me, it would take an hour. Okay. But I've been doing exegetical work for 20 years. For somebody that is kind of starting from scratch, it'll take, it'll take longer. Okay. But it is, it's like anything else. You know, you kind of get proficient at it. You you develop a system. And <clears throat> I know that Michael Hyde will say this 9,285 times I've counted in uh, <laughs> ministry tech. Uh, how much Logos will help you uh, and how Diddy used to spend X number of hours uh, doing this, and now it took me, what, 2.3 seconds. And he just loves, you know, am I right? Um, well, but that is true. Okay. The stuff that used to take me a long, long time to do, Logos will do it for you in a second. So you got a, a great tool uh, with uh, Logos with exegesis. What was the book for this book you I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. Do you, um, when you said earlier, um, you referred to your commentary, was that just for illustration or do you really have commentary? No, I really do have a commentary. I'm okay. Timothy Titus. But you don't like other people's commentary? Not in some ways, I don't like mine. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I was confused. Although. My commentary is more exegetical, but you have a different approach to it. Yeah, he glorified God in his. <laughs> <laughs> even uh, even as being preachers or anybody that's studying the Word of God, even if we read your commentary, it's going to be doing us well to look into it to make sure that your commentary is correct with the Word of God. Not saying that it would be wrong. <laughs> no, because you know I I look at some of this stuff that I wrote in the commentary, and I don't even agree with me <laughs> anymore. Because I've studied more, and I've learned more. And so, uh, you know, there are some aspects to that. I'm thinking, eh, I was a little shallow in my understanding of that. Uh, so now I know more. And that's what I would hope you would find, too, say, well, Kitty was a little shallow there. <laughs> hey, keep it to ourselves. So say we're teaching this somewhere, something like this, we're teaching a uh, class on, on digging deeper, and a lot of times this maybe comes up when you say, you know, I know the translation says this, but if you really look at the Greek, whatever, and sometimes people at that point say, you know what, God intended his word to be easy for everyone to understand, we don't need to know Greek, we don't need to use these tools you're giving us, it's supposed to be just, how, how do you help somebody through that process? Well, I, I have a joke that I say, you know, if God wanted us to know Greek, he would have written the New Testament in it. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're going, I thought he did write the New Testament. Yeah, that's exactly the point. That is the language that God chose to use. He didn't choose to use English, he chose to use Greek. All right, that being the case, then we would probably do well to familiarize ourselves with the meaning of those original words. And granted, most of the time, the English translation does a, a, a good job. 
But like with all languages, you know, words have, you know, different nuances of, of meaning. And sometimes we get a clearer view of what a passage is saying by understanding more of the way the word is used. And so, and I point out, that is the language that God chose. Uh, Hebrew for the Old Testament, that's the language God chose. And so, you know, a lot of times you even say the word Greek, and I've seen this a million times, people gloss over. You know, in the Greek it's just like, Well, <laughs> 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 deer at the headlight, look, and then, I, you know, I have trouble. Come back to me, <laughs> you know, come back to earth. Um, so, those of you that, uh, you know, Dustin that sat in my sessions, the workshop, or the uh, recharge, the very first thing I say is I make, you have to make a promise that you will not go glossed over whenever I say Greek. <laughs> that you're going to stay with me, and uh, we're going we're gonna to work through this together. But, um, but that, that's a challenge. Uh, and people, they, uh, they have sold themselves short. And students at Bear Valley have sold themselves short on, on what kind of quality work you can do with the Greek. Now, you may never, and probably most of you, will never get to where you read the Greek New Testament. That's okay. You can still get to heaven uh, without reading the Greek New Testament. You won't have as big as a room. <laughs> But you can do you can do a lot better work than you think you can. And again, the, the logo software that uh, Mike will uh, teach you how to use will be one of those resources that uh, that will help you do some excellent uh, word study work, some exegetical work, and uh, I'll even talk about some of the. the the ways that you can use logos in this class in um, in doing exegetical work as well. So you're going to kind of get a, a little bit of a head start on that. But it, it is one of the problems. <clears throat> when you're trying to get people to, uh, to study their Bible more deeply, this is what uh, this is what I've done. I did a men's retreat in Idaho a couple of months ago in which um, I told them, I said, I want to do something totally different than what normally happens in a men's retreat. Uh, you know, typically, a men's retreat, you know, one year you're going to study God's name, and the next year you're going to study men of God. And then the third year, you're going to study being a man of God. <laughs> and then, you know, when I, I'm telling this story to Wayne Berger, and Wayne Berger says, I know exactly, and he did the men's retreat the year before that. He said, and I told him I was going to do something different too. And I said, really? What would you do? And he said, God's men from the Old Testament. <laughs> 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 way to get out there, way to <laughs> Really get outside the box. So, okay, so what I want to do is I want to do a men's retreat on how to study the Bible, on exegesis. So, they um, reluctantly agreed to uh, my doing that. So what I did is I talked about some fundamental principles of studying the Bible. And, you know, I asked the question, I said, how many of you study the Bible? And nearly everybody in the room said, <laughs> some of men raised their hand. And so I pointed to a guy and said, okay, what, what, what do you do? He said, well, I have a, uh, a, a chart where in one year's time, I read through the, the Bible. So I've got a portion in the morning, and I've got a portion in the evening that I read. Okay? How about you? What do you do? He said, well, I do similar things. I have uh, basically a, a period of time of which, you know, I'm, I'm breaking down the, the, the Bible by chapters, and so I'm reading a chapter at breakfast, I'm reading some chapters at lunch, and I'm reading. And I said, here's our problem. None of you have said anything about study. Reading is not study. 
lot of people think they study, but they're reading. And that's, there's a big difference between studying and reading. And so now we've got to go from reading something to studying something. You know, the blessed man of Psalm 1 meditates on God's word day and night. Well, that meditation is a Hebrew word that means intensive examination and research. He's not sitting under a shade tree reading going, oh, that's cool. (laughs) He's digging. He's working. He's researching. That's study. And so what I did with the men's retreat is something that you've heard us uh, preach here at Bear Valley, uh, those of you that are about to graduate, of color coding, marking your Bible, finding, examining, identifying, marking keywords, and then looking at that. And uh, what is it you see when you got these words marked? Now, I gave them, for example, I used First Peter. I gave them all of the key words in First Peter, and <clears throat> I told them ahead of time. If you don't want to write in your Bible, then bring a Bible you don't mind writing in. But everybody's going to write in their Bible. Uh, And everybody, the church bought those packets of colored pencils for everybody. Uh, So everybody had their own little packet of colored pencils. All right. So I said, all right, take that first sheet. Got the word suffering. All the time, places the word suffering occurs, just pick a color, any color, maybe red since it's suffering. That might make sense. Uh, color all those in. Okay? What do you see? Well, I thought that they, this was going to get have a real slow start <laughs> because they're not used to this sort of thing. Well, I was thankfully very wrong about that. I mean, we had guys, immediately I had about seven or eight hands go up. And guys are saying... Well, I noticed that, first of all, suffering occurs an awful lot in a five-chapter book. I said, right. So what do you get from that? Well, apparently it's very important. Okay. Did you know that suffering was an important word in First Peter? He said, no, and I just got done teaching that book. Oh. Okay. Good. <laughs> well, not good, but good. <laughs> well, saw that. <clears throat> all right, another guy says, well, the word suffering occurs in every chapter. Okay. Good. What do you get from that? Well, that it's kind of like a theme, a predominant concept that runs through the book. Okay? Did you know that? No. Did you know that suffering occurred in this chapter? No. But you do now. And now you've you've seen, well, anyway, this is an awful long answer to a short question. (laughs) People can do this. And you start walking through the process. Um, I'm still getting emails from guys up there saying, okay, give me the key words of Nehemiah. I'm studying Nehemiah next. And I'm, I'm glad to do that, and I'm, I'm also giving them ideas on where they can find those key words for themselves. Uh, but you, there are free tools online that you can find these key words. So you don't need to have logos. You don't need to email me uh, to get them, but you can get them. And uh, so, anyway, it's it's very doable. So, anyway, Bart, you yeah, uh, you know, as a young Christian, 20 plus years ago, I was, you know, whatever the leaders taught me, I respected them, I just followed them. Just like uh, I told you several weeks ago when I visited, was I was been using all this time the NIV, and I thought you know, I was on the right track until you explained it more in depth, but. <laughs> I've benefited tremendously as a young Christian with Matthew Henry. I mean, the commentary, that's what I was recommended, referred to by several, and I benefited tremendously. It expanded my understanding, thinking. Yeah. Obviously, as time passed, just like I shared with my students, don't buy everything, read, believe everything you read. Filter it. You know, dissect it. Yeah. And have your own opinion. But, you know, in this one, you know, but that has helped me tremendously. I'm not saying that I won't uh, gear myself towards, you know, digging more. Yeah, and and really the the end goal of all this is 
where people really feel like they can do good work just studying the Bible. They really don't need, and I use I use the word crutches. They don't need the the crutches of a Matthew Henry or the, you know, granted, you got to learn to walk, and you know, having some other resources uh, might be helpful at first, but ultimately, we need to get to the point where it's just me in this book, and I know what to do. I'm looking at a passage. I have no idea what that passage means, but I know what to do in order to figure out what that passage is saying, and I don't need to go to some commentary or anything else in order to find out what that passage means. You know, one real quick thing, and we'll talk more about the translations later, but uh, since I was talking about the men's retreat, so anyway, I've, I've got them, all the word, and I told them, I said, this is every place that the Greek word for suffering occurs. So even though I'm giving it to you in English, the, the Greek word is actually uh, what we're looking at. So these are all the times the Greek word suffering occurs. So I've got this guy that goes, so what's up? He said, word suffering is not in that verse. He said, what verse are you talking about? And he told me whatever it was. And the guy next to him says, yeah, it is. The guy next to him says, yeah, it is. And I said, what translation you got? NIV. <laughs> Another guy over there goes, I can't find it either. Another guy back there says, I can't find it either. And and uh, so, anyway, that happened six or seven times no, that right. the word suffering that was in the Greek was not translated at all in the NIV. Now, right there, if you don't need any other reason that right there was reason enough not to use the NIV because you cannot do exegetical work in the NIV. You can't. And the reason is because the translating philosophy, which is called dynamic equivalent, they're not interested in going translating each word. They're just giving you the general idea. So they don't feel like they needed to translate the word suffering every time it occurred. Well, and as a result, you would have no idea that that is a predominant thread all through the book. You would never know that. And if you don't know that, then you're not going to know what are the primary reasons that he's writing that book. You're going to miss it all together. So you've got translations that are good uh, at doing exegetical work and others that are you're not ever going to succeed. Uh, what, what, in your opinion, would you say are the best versions? The very best versions would be the New American Standard and the New King James. Now, the most literal translation is the ASV. Um, the ASV, they were the only translation that uh, they were going to go word for word. Every Hebrew word was going to have an English equivalent. Every Greek word was going to have an English equivalent. Um, but as a result, the... Um, the ASV is wooden, but they call it wooden. It just doesn't flow well. But the uh, New American Standard and the, the New King James, I think, are the two best. One of the teachers here says when they first convert somebody, he likes to get them started on the NIV and then have a year or two later try to wean them off and get them on, like, New American Standard. Is that a good idea, a bad idea? Um, the NIV was written for um, more of a high school level. And it was written to have ease of uh, readability. And so I, I think that's probably the, the reason for it is because the NIV does read very, very easily. That's why uh, teenagers are, are in love with the NIV. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I kind of understand the, the rationale behind it. But I always think it's a good idea to get somebody where they have a companion uh, like a parallel New Testament, where maybe you've got the NIV and then something else that is a better translation like the King James and New King James or something like that. And, and tell them that up front, you know, kind of compare uh, between the two. But, you know. else? All right, so exegesis is not like a commentary. Second, exegesis is not a succession of word studies.
chances are most people that have ever heard the word exegesis, if you ask them what that means, this would be the definition they give. And in a way, I've I've kind of got the ball rolling on that, even in this class for the Acts 1-8 assignment, when I'm saying, okay, let me just kind of illustrate uh, what you're looking at. Okay, so I'm going to do exegetical work on X 1-8. But, is a conjunction normally means a contrast. You is a personal pronoun, and it is here plural. Shall is a... And by the time you get to the third word, you are bored out of your ever-loving mind, and you think of this exegetical stuff is not for me. Well, that's because that's not exegesis. But a lot of people think it is. You're just going to go through and you're going to hyperanalyze every single aspect of every particular word, and that's exegesis. No, it's not a succession of word studies. Uh, that's not exegesis. Now, as I mentioned here, studying words is a part of exegesis. But it is not in and of itself uh, what exegetical work is all about. It's a lot more exciting than that. Third, exegesis is not a synonym to hermeneutics. times if they know maybe a little bit more about exegesis, they'll say, well, it's hermeneutics. Well, again, that is not correct. Exegesis is where you determine what a passage, what a passage is saying. You are not going to de determine what the passage means. That's hermeneutics application of uh, a passage that's you know just right now what is it saying what do the words in this verse mean what is it that uh, he's saying here and how does it fit with the overall context of the paragraph of the uh, the chapter of the book as as a whole it's not uh, hermeneutics at all. Hermeneutics follows exegesis. But the problem is, and again, uh, one more slam on commentaries, <laughs> is that's what commentaries do. They are bypassing exegesis and getting to hermeneutics, to application, what you are supposed to do uh, with this particular verse. Well, that's the cart before the horse. That is uh, the wrong way of looking at something. So, before you should ever even think about applying a verse, saying this is what we need to do, you've got to do the exegetical work. And then you can talk about application. And your hermeneutical work is going to be a whole lot better because it's got a solid foundation of exegesis underneath it. So, it's always best to do uh, exegesis first. Hayes and Holiday <clears throat> said exegesis is best thought of as a systematic way of interpreting a text. Alright, so there is a system. What I'm going to do, how I'm going to approach a text, I've got a system in place. As noted earlier, everyone engages in exegesis in one form or another. But biblical exegesis has its own specialized needs and disciplines. Its goal, however, is quite simple. To reach an informed understanding of the text.
Danny? Yes. Um, and you may get into this later, but like I got my Bible open here to Acts 1 8, and halfway through you've got a semicolon. Can we interpret, now this is New American Standard, can we interpret those semicolons like we would in the English language such that they're two joining thoughts? You know what I mean? Because right. the sentence structure is atrocious. Yeah. Um, no, you, you probably would just because you're looking at the English text and that's what's there. Um, but... <coughs> Going to the next level, we understand that Greek didn't have right. uh, semicolons, and so you have to look at the possibility that uh, there there are not two independent clauses connected with the, the semicolon, but instead they're related somehow, uh, and maybe there there shouldn't be a, even a comma there. So look at the possibilities. Okay. You also apply that to verses and chapters? Right. Yeah. Um, the Bible was divided in chapters by Stephen Langton in 1271 A.D. So we went nearly 1,300 years without the Bible being divided in chapters. And then uh, it wasn't until the 1500s that the Bible was divided in verses. So that's all the creation of man. And I don't know, uh, Mark, if you've heard the, the joke about uh, the, the guy that was that we used his notes on dividing the verses. He says, uh, this is at least a legend, that as he was riding on his donkey from village to village, um, you know, the donkey just following the path so he doesn't have to do anything. So he's, he's working on dividing the Bible up. And, and when he's about ready to mark, the, a division, the the donkey stumbles and he marks it there. That well, he must have hit a bump right there because that was a very poor place to uh, do a division. <laughs> well, that's the legend. I don't know how true it is, but <laughs> but there are some very very poor chapter breaks and some very poor uh, verse uh, divisions for sure. And they're not inspired. How do you deal with that in in exegesis? I mean, you're working with just. Actually, exegesis is going to help considerably um, because you already know this in advance, and so you're you're going to train yourself not to look at the chapter breaks or even the verse division. You're going to be thinking of, of a of a greater context that even spills over to the previous chapter or maybe into the next chapter. So it'll help a lot. All right. This is the, the end all of Bible study. Why is it that there's not much of it being done, or little being done? <coughs> All right, four reasons. First, some have never been trained. So they would be doing it if they knew how to do it. Um, but because they've never really learned uh, how to do it, then... Obviously, they're not, they're not doing this kind of work. Second, some do not see the value of such research. You know, I'm doing for the master's class advanced hermeneutics and this morning we were talking about uh, some of those among us including college professors that are arguing that uh, everything important God spells it out in black and white and that if it's something that we have to 
come to understand through human logic and reasoning, then God's not going to hold us responsible for that. Only the stuff that is, thou shalt not steal. It's got to be as clear as that for God to hold us accountable to it. And so, exegesis is where you're, you're digging deeper. You're looking at the, the nuances and the twists and the uh, various aspects of what these Bible verses are saying. And there are those among us that would go, eh, it's a waste of time. Because it's not important. You know, what God spells out very clearly, you don't need exegesis uh, to understand that. Uh, so, there are some that just don't see uh, the value, that it is basically a waste of time. The third reason little exegetical work is being done Did you convert to NIVs by the time you read the uh, retreat was finished? Every single one of them said they were done with the NIV. They said they were done with what? With the NIV. Okay, let's take a break. Those kids are going to be We all know that it is a whole lot easier to go to the, the shelf and pull off my commentary to find out what that is for the dead. That is a whole lot easier. Uh, and that's what people do. That's what people like to do. And, uh, you know, the, uh, they like I mentioned, the McDonald's mentality, the, the fast food, quick fix uh, type of thing, and that's what... Uh, what people want, that's what people like, and granted, we are, as a whole, a, a very lazy people, and we've got so many distractions and so many diversions with uh, TV and internet and all these other things that back in the in the old days, before there were all of those, that's basically what people did, is they just uh, spent time with their Bible, but now... We really do have to use a lot of discipline to shove those other things away and do the kind of, uh, uh, spend the kind of time that quality exegetical work demands. And uh, again, there are just some that are, now nah, it's just not for me, it's, it's going to take too much time uh, to, you know, I need to find out what Acts 1-8, I'm not going to spend two hours doing it. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go pull off this commentator. I, I like this guy, and, and uh, you know, he's a brother, so you've got to be right. Uh, and uh, that's going to be uh, my viewpoint. Well, uh, get what you deserve uh, when, uh, when that's your approach. And he may be right, but he may also not be right. But you're never going to be a good Bible student that way. You might know some things. <clears throat> but, you know, I was, um, I'm working with a guy that has got some problems. And uh, I was talking to his wife, and I said that the thing is, is he's got, um, there are two different words in the Greek for no. 
you've got a don't, which has to do basically with intellectual, factual knowledge. And then you've got gnosko, and sometimes it's epigenosko, which is a word that means experiential knowledge. And you can get some of the, the a don't type knowledge by reading commentaries. But you're never going to, to have a knowledge of God without experiencing the, the God through a deeper study of, of his word. And that's what exegesis does. Um, you feel closer to God. You feel like you've honored him uh, by spending the additional time and devotion in studying his word. And, you know, Jesus said in John 17, 3, that this is eternal life, that they know thee, the only true God, uh, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Uh, well, that's a, that's gnosko. And eternal life is dependent not upon our knowing some facts about God, but knowing God. And the only way that you get to know God is to live with God, to experience God, and to have a relationship with God. And, you know, the, the way I get to know you is to spend time with you, to listen to you talk, uh, to find out what you like and what you don't like, what things you enjoy, uh, what are the interests. And the more that I hear you talk, the more I know you. Well, now, when I got your application, I read what you said about yourself. And so I had that surface knowledge. And somebody said, okay, uh, you know, tell me uh, a little a bit about Jake. Okay. Bullet points. I can tell you that. But did I know him? Nah, not really. I knew some facts about him, but I didn't know him. Well, that's the way it is with a lot of people with God, and that's the way it is with this guy uh, that I'm working with. He knows God in that he studied his Bible, and so he knows some facts and figures, uh, maybe some Bible passages that describe attributes of God, but has never really lived with God, experienced God. Uh, and so he doesn't have a gnosko knowledge. Well, anyway, my point is this. Exegesis is something that will bring you closer to God than you ever thought possible. Because you are analyzing his words so thoroughly, so carefully, that there's a respect that goes with that. And it just in, increases and improves uh, your relationship with him because now you're feeling like you are having that gnosko uh, kind of knowledge. Well, unfortunately, there are some that are just, they're just too lazy. Uh, this requires more work than they're willing to, uh, to spend. And so, uh, well, that's why there are some that are, so many that are not doing exegetical work. All right. So let's get into some different aspects. And we're still in the introduction, obviously. <coughs> the matter is, we exegete every day. Now, we didn't know we were exegeting, but we were. <laughs> All right, let's say that we had a script, and Jake said, Denny, can I leave class to go to the restroom? And so Jake asked Denny, could I go to the restroom? Denny said, okay. But if Jake says, Denny, can I go to the restroom? And I go, okay. 
are you going to get somewhat of a different idea on how I felt about his bathroom bath, bathroom break? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your body language, your tone. Yeah, you exegeted. Now, the words were the same. And when you type it out, and all you're doing is recording the words, then you get one particular idea. But when we're involved in exegeting, we, we include all of these other factors. Body language, tonation of the voice, and so on. And all of that contributes to what we eventually concluded uh, was the meaning. The wife says, you love me, he goes, I love you. Well, she probably is going to put on her exegetical hat and assume probably not as much as I would, would like. Uh, it didn't sound like. He said he loved me, but it didn't sound like he did. Well, when we interact with each other, the process of exegesis is going on. And what we're doing when we're talking about biblical exegesis is we're looking at words on a page. But what we're doing is we're trying to draw in what other factors are there that are going to help us understand almost tonation, almost um, body language that is going along with uh, uh, what's being said. And uh, that's using what we already know. But the fact of the matter is there has to be exegesis for there to be communication and understanding. <coughs> Because what we're doing is we're analyzing what a person is saying. We talk about reading between the lines. <clears throat> and one of the things that people say that they hate about email correspondence mm -hmm. is the hidden messages that are, are there. Um, why is it they say you should never use capital, capitalized words? <laughs> angry. Because you're yelling. You're angry. It's, it's equivalent to yelling. Well, until somebody told me that, I didn't know I was yelling <laughs> so much. But apparently I was yelling a lot of emails. But um, I was trying to be emphatic. I wasn't trying to yell. <laughs> so you're, you're analyzing what a person is saying. Was it a question? Uh, was it a statement? We'll ask, are words to be taken literally or symbolically? I grew up in a family where I had two older brothers and an older sister, and we were a bunch of jokesters, and we're constantly ragging on each other, and, um, you know, calling each other names, and so it was not unusual at all for uh, my older brothers to call me everything from <laughs> stupid to nerd to dorky to clumsy to, and I mean, it was just the environment that I was brought up in, and it was water off a duck's back. I mean, it was just playful banter that wasn't didn't really mean anything. 
And then I married Kathy, <laughs> who was not brought up in said environment. As a matter of fact, she was brought up in an environment in which everything was prime and proper, and you did not jest. And so when I said early in our marriage, you are such a nerd. <laughs> that did not go over well. <laughs> and I didn't understand why, because to me, that was playful banter, and there was nothing that was meant by it, but with her, it was very critical and insulting, and well, so I had to, to learn <laughs> a little bit about language and communication. Are, are words uh, to be taken literally? Did I mean it literally? No. Um, but when we talk about communication, uh, we, we have to learn and are learning all the time about uh, exegeting what other people say. We go through it all the time. It is something that we learn from uh, infancy, and then we just hone that skill as we grow up. writers of the New Testament wrote in such a way to display this type of emotion and stuff like that? Because like you were talking about in, in a text message or in, in email, it seems like a lot of the translation is lost. And when you read it, it seems like, well, oh, that person could be mad because they just gave me a short response and there wasn't, you know, yeah. there wasn't an exclamation point or something like that. Do you think the Greek writers wrote in a way that displayed this? I know they did. And the, the way that we can understand that is through the, the study of words and how words were used in the Greek language. Let me give you a, a real quick illustration. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Paul here is talking about the people of God, and he's illustrating it with a tree. And all of the branches of this tree are the people of God. And he's talking specifically to Gentiles. The Gentiles were not originally a part of God's tree, God's people. The Jews were God's chosen people. But then, when the gospel was introduced, the Jews that rejected the gospel were branches that were cut off the tree. And then the Gentiles, who accepted the gospel, were then grafted on to this tree that represents the people of God. That's his illustration. Verse 19, you, that is a Gentile, will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Verse 20, the New American Standard translates it quite right. But the Greek word is not, first of all, doesn't mean quite right. The Greek word is kalos, and kalos means, well, hmm. well, <laughs> Paul is not agreeing with the statement in verse 19. Some arrogant, bigoted, egotistical Gentile is saying, Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And he's going, ah, well. So he really, when you study this, you see he's using a word that doesn't mean quite right. It means, uh, the truth of the matter is, they were broken off for their unbelief. They were not broken off to make room for you. They were broken off because... They failed to believe and embrace the gospel. That's why they were broken off. 
So I'm writing my notes. So the word is uh. uh. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wrote that. <laughs> Not sure I'm going to put that on my test, though. Part of our problem is illustrated in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. So he wants to talk about some of the things that our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. Verse 16, um, which also in all of his epistles is speaking of these things, which are difficult, some, some of which is difficult to understand. <clears throat> All right, so Paul has written some things. Some of those things, he says, are difficult to understand. Now, we've talked about this before. He doesn't say impossible. He says difficult. Now, why would God inspire Paul to write something that is going to be tough to get, to be difficult to understand? Well, because God wants us to be like miners. God wants us to say, all right, I'm going to get after this, and I'm going to figure this out. That's what God wants. And when you study uh, passages like Matthew 13, the parable chapter, Jesus was asked, why are you doing this? Why are you talking in parables? <clears throat> and Jesus quotes from Isaiah 6, and he's making the point that the parables are going to turn away or make a separation between the truth seekers and those who are not truth seekers. Because the truth seekers are going to say, all right, I know he's not talking about some kid throwing seed that landed in four different spots. I'm going to figure out, I'm going to find out what he's talking about. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. Because he wanted to find those people that were true seekers. But also, it would separate those that were going, okay, I'm out of here. I'm not going to listen to this, these foolish stories about some guy throwing seeds and lands among weeds. I've got more important things to do than listening to, to this foolishness. Well, there are some things that Paul wrote that are difficult to understand. Alright, so that was part of God's plan. And when we talk exegesis, we're saying those are there are those passages that are out there that are tough passages. And God made them that way. Yeah? He made them that way. And there are a lot of people that don't want to believe that. Oh, my God would never purposely be confusing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he would. Why? Why would he do that? Because he wants us to dig. So, there are the untaught that he says we're going to twist and distort these things.
we do not want to fall into this category where we make applications from passages out of ignorance. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We don't want to go there. We don't want to be there. And when we think about it, Jesus, you've got to look at 2 Peter 3 because there's that body of people out there that are just untaught. They have not trained themselves to study the scriptures in uh, a competent way. And when that happens, and they're going to make applications that are going to be wrong. Then he talks about the untaught and the unstable. I've got cross-reference Ephesians 4.14 where he talks about, you know, driven and tossed by every wind of doctrine. I mean, the person's over here one day and over there the next day. Well, that's describing this person that Peter's talking about here. They are just unsettled. They're unstable. They haven't done enough work to really root and ground themselves in God's word where when you're hearing all of these people say, oh, baptism is not necessary. That's not going to move them because they've already done the work. They've already done the study. They know what the text says. And so these hurricane force winds might be blowing against them, but they are rock solid, grounded in the truth of God's word. But when a person hasn't spent the time really studying God's word, and you've got these powerful forces. You've got the, the televangelists who seem to be so knowledgeable and they're so polished and uh, so per, uh, persuasive. So you go along with them. They sweep you right off and carry you off into some false doctrine. Well, that's what we're trying to avoid. Exegesis is going to make you more solid in God's word than you've ever been before. Where uh, Satan can blow against your spiritual house all he wants, but you're founded on a rock and you're not going to be moved. Then he says that these untaught and unstable, they twist This is a gross word because it really means the idea or has the idea of twisting and torturing a, a, a body on a rack.
Okay, so just like a limb, it's designed by God to bend like that. Notice I didn't scream in pain. Uh, you know, I just bent it and, you know, it all is good. Because it was supposed to go that way. So I'm looking at a passage, and that passage says, I do not allow a woman to speak in church. Okay, what are you going to do with that? That women should not speak in church. Okay, that, that was pretty easy. That just went just exactly with uh, what the text is saying. Yeah, but that really doesn't mean that. What that means is, and now all of a sudden, you're taking this and you're wanting to wrench it and bend it in a direction that it wasn't meant to go. The clear natural meaning, well, there are some that are trying to do this with God's word. It says what it says, no, it doesn't, it means this. And they're going to twist it and distort it to where now it doesn't mean that anymore. I call it textual gymnastics, but Peter's word is uh, more graphic. They're doing violence to God's word, just like you're doing violence to the human body if you're making a joint go in a direction it wasn't meant to go. Uh, and that's what people are, are having to do with God's word. They're having to go against the natural flow or the natural meaning or the natural application of a passage and force it to go a different direction. And that's what we see with baptism. That's what we see with the uniqueness of the church. That's what we see with leadership. That's what we see with the role of women. That's what we see with so many biblical topics is we've got these people that are trying to make it go a different direction. Well, who are these people? Peter said they're either unlearned or they're unstable. They're one of the two. Maybe both, I guess. So, the problem that we face... Well, wait. I'm not ready for that yet. It's gone. <laughs> yeah. Give up, Jim. He's probably already got it down. People say... Let me get back to what I was saying earlier. If it's important, so they say, then God's going to give it to us on a silver plate. It's going to be black and white. Thou shalt not steal. Everybody gets that. Everybody knows what that means. And God's not playing games with us. He's not playing fast and loose with us. He's just laying it all out there as clear as can be. So, when you look at a passage like 2 Peter 3.16, you've got the difficult things that Paul has written, with the untaught and the unstable, twist and distort. But it's not really that big a deal because God purposely gave it to us in difficult, hard to understand language. And so since it wasn't given to us on a silver platter, very easy to understand, then God's not going to hold us accountable, right? What does the last part of verse 16 say in your Bible? To their own destruction. Oh, wow. That kind of moved it into a whole new category. Now I can't say, well, those difficult passages, if you don't get it, then that's fine. If there are difficult passages and you're twisting and distorting that, it's to your own destruction. Now, so how is it going to work on the day of judgment that you go to God and say, but God, what you had to say about women was so confusing. What you had to say about instruments in worship was just so veiled. Why don't you just lay it out? Thou shalt not use instruments in worship. Why did you have to kind of cloak it all in this other... What's God going to say? It was your responsibility. Mm -hmm. figure it out. To be learned. To be stable. And you can twist and you can distort it, but it's to your own destruction. And God's not going to say, okay, I, I did make it kind of hard to see. It was difficult. I inspired Paul to write it in a way that was kind of difficult. So, come on. It's not going to happen. 
reminds me of uh, Paul. He went, I think, to Thessalonica, and he says, these guys are still on milk. You should be on solid meat by now, S- solid food. And he was, I think, lifting up the Bereans. Well, yeah, in Acts 17. To examine the scriptures. The, the milk and meat is uh, in Hebrews 5. Um, they need to be past that. By this time, you ought to be telling teachers. That's convicting. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, the problems we face. The first is people don't know what the book says. widespread ignorance of what the Bible teaches in the church and outside the church is astounding. And um, we're, we're, no long, we're way past that time where uh, people in the Church of Christ were recognized as being good uh, students of the Bible. We're way past that. Because uh, we're not anymore. Uh, but <clears throat> so we're preaching to people, we're teaching people that really don't know um, the Bible. You know, I was doing a seminar and uh, was telling one of the one of the Old Testament stories. Uh, and there was a, a person that had been in the church 30 years that had never heard that. He thought, wow, uh, that, that shouldn't have been news to somebody in the church that long. Uh, but that's the way that's the way people are. Um, they, you know, I, actually I was using the illustration of Elijah on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. I'd never heard that before. Well, we got people that don't know the Bible for sure. There was a survey that was done, and I've tried to get uh, more solid information on this. I just remember the fact of it. But the, the statistics, uh, I don't know that I ever received them, but um, there was a church about the size of Bear Valley. It was not a survey that was done at Bear Valley, but it was about 350, 400 member congregation. Uh, and when they were asked to give one Bible passage on baptism, they couldn't do it. Over 90% of the people that took the survey could not get one passage on baptism. Well, how can that be uh, that we have become so biblically illiterate that we can't even have somebody turn to one passage? I mean, don't we hit Acts 2.38 just about every Sunday? I mean, at least you think they're going to come up with Acts 2.38, but couldn't even do that. Another problem we face is that people don't know how to study the Bible. Now, I already talked about the, um, the, the men's response at the men's retreat. When I asked them, you know, how many studied the Bible, and I asked them, they said they did. When... In actuality, all they're doing is reading the Bible, which is good. I'm not downplaying reading, but they're not studying, and a lot of people don't know how to study. And we complicate or we perpetuate this problem when we say, all right, today we're going to begin a study of the the book of Daniel, so everybody turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1. And you read chapter 1 and verse 1, and all right, so... What, what do you get from that? Well, I think it means this. And okay, good, good. What do you think? Well, I think it means that. And the other guy says something completely different than what the first guy says. Good, good. Appreciate that. All right, any other comments? <laughs> All right, verse 2. Well, that's our, the way that we study 
the Bible. And so if somebody is at home and they're going to say, you know, I need to start studying the Bible on my own, they're going to duplicate the ridiculousness of what we frequently do in Bible class. And that is they're going to open it up to chapter 1, verse 1, and they're going to read it, and maybe they'll give a surface thought on what it means, and then they'll move on to verse 2 and maybe do the same with that. So we're dealing with people that really do need to be taught a methodology, a way to study the Bible that they can use and apply uh, to their own lives. And then a third problem, people don't respect the authority of Scripture. some ways, I feel sorry for you guys that are the next generation of preachers, because you are probably not going to have the advantage or the blessing that I had early in my ministry when I'm talking to a Methodist, turn to the Bible, if that's what it says, that's what it meant. Presbyterian, Lutheran. I mean, you could. That's the authority right there. And if there was a disagreement on a biblical doctrine, show them the passage. Wow. I've been wrong about that. But that we're not there anymore. Even in people in the church, you can show them what a passage says. And it's like, well, I'm still not sure I buy that. <laughs> and it's even worse than those in the denominational world. There's just no respect for biblical authority. You know, Paul complimented the people at Thessalonica in Second First Timothy 2.13, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, when he talked about when they preached to them, you accepted it. Not as the words of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. So, they, uh, Paul compliments them for having that wisdom to understand the difference between what men say and what God says. Because there's you know, the difference of eternity between the two. Is the passage that you were talking about the one where he's talking, saying the Bereans examined these things? They did That's Acts 17.11. Okay. Is that right? 17.11? This is a quote from a guy by the name of Robert Johnson. He's uh, not a member of the church, but what a great quote. He says, Contemporary evangelicals are finding it difficult to achieve anything like a consensus on each succeeding theological topic they address. Moreover, they seem stymied in any effort toward unity, unable to agree on a collective interpretive strategy we're moving beyond their current impasse. All right. So he's writing this in 1979. He's recognizing that there is great disunity among evangelical churches. They are unable, he says, to agree on a collective interpretive strategy. How are we to interpret Scripture? He goes on to say, if evangelicals cannot discover a way to move more effectively toward theological consensus, how can they still maintain, in good conscience, their claim to biblical authority as a hallmark? If the Bible is the authority, then shouldn't we come to a consensus? Shouldn't we ultimately find agreement in the various issues that we deal with? Well, I find it interesting that a denominational guy hits the nail on the head here. 
and as exactly uh, as exactly right. We claim biblical authority, but we practice everything but biblical authority. If we had, if we truly respected biblical authority, then we would be in agreement, and there would be harmony and unity, uh, even among evangelicals. But the fact that there's so much a variety of opinion and doctrine practice among even even evangelical churches show that the the claim for biblical authority are just words, and they're not something that is really showing itself in practice. Is that why we have so many denominations? Yeah, yeah, because if the Bible was the sole authority, then these denominations would. Fade away. T.S. Eliot wrote something. He wrote something that, was, that he called the hollow men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dry voice, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as dry, as wind in dry grass. Well, today we see hollow men in the pulpits of some congregations. Like scarecrows, they're arrayed in suits and ties. They stand before their audience. They say nothing, nothing of substance. They have no deep faith, no convictions about moral and spiritual matters. Uh, they can adjust themselves to whatever times their audience demands. They say nothing of consequence. They do nothing of lasting value. They just fill their post. They draw their salary. They die and are soon forgotten because they're hollow men. Imagine the shame and fear when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And they look around and they see the likes of Jeremiah, of Stephen, of Paul. Scarecrows don't fare well, well in fire. The faithful man of God is not going to be a hollow man. He will not attempt to be neutral in the great conflicts that confront the cause of Christ. He's not going to shy away from the major issues that are part of the religious world today. He's going to preach the word in season and out, whether it's popular or not, 2 Timothy 4.2. He's going to stand fast in the faith, 1 Corinthians 6.13. He's going to fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6.12. He's going to contend earnestly for the faith, Jude 3. Uh, he's going to be willing to suffer hardship for the Lord, 2 Timothy 2, 3. He's going to be not a hollow man, but a man that's got some substance, that's got some grit, some determination, and he's willing to stand in the gap and face the tough challenges. Exegetical work is what fills us up and keeps us from being so shallow, so hollow, where... All we give, and this is a favorite word of mine, and I think Michael likes to use it a lot too, fluff. A lot of fluff. A lot of fluff sermons. A lot of fluff Bible classes. Uh, there's just nothing there. There's nothing of substance that is really going to be of any value or of any importance. So the importance of exegesis. <clears throat> All will stand before the throne to be judged from the things which were written in the book.
He that said, my word will judge him on the last day. It's imperative that we follow the exhortation Paul gave to Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.15 to be diligent to present yourself to prove to God a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Handling accurately the word of truth. Well, the word ergon, which is the word that he uses for workman, is a very common word in the Greek New Testament. It describes the ditch digger uh, as well as any manual labor. You just, it's work. Well, you have to be diligent to present yourself to God as an unashamed worker. You will, I will, present myself to God. And we will all be judged on how we handle God's holy revelation, His inspired word. And if we were careless and flippant, if we were of a hollow man, then we're going to be judged accordingly. James 3, 1, be not many teachers, knowing that you're going to incur what? Stricter judgment. Well, if I'm going to choose to teach, and I have chosen to teach, then I better get it right. And I better have the kind of work ethic that Paul's talking about in 2 Timothy 2.15. Because there is a accurate way of handling the truth, but there's also an inaccurate way. And if Timothy is not going to work hard, then he's in danger of handling the word inaccurately. That goes along with the untaught of 2 Peter 3.16. I love this quote from Erasmus, and I just throw it in, not that it really has that much to do with what we're talking about, but when I get a little money, I buy books. And if any is left, I buy food and clothes. Who's Erasmus? Erasmus was a guy that was contemporary with Martin Luther. He's the guy that gave us the the uh, Texas Receptus, Greek New Testament. He was a scholar of his day. I've always said, Kathy, that he must not have been married because his wife would never have gone. But really, it has to do with priorities. Uh, what is it that is most important to us? And, you know, with Erasmus, while he was being funny with his statement, but it was also a level of seriousness that, yeah, um, these are things that are very important. And so I want to make sure that uh, I devote myself to the most important things and our most important thing is the study of God's Word. Okay, this actually is a really good place to stop, and I'm past ready to stop uh, because my mouth hurts. So uh, we'll stop there and uh, pick up with, uh, with this on Thursday. So be ready. Have your Acts 1 8 thing ready to turn in. Also read those two assigned chapters in the book and be ready for possible. Kozarewski. Right. Did you go to the dentist?